Great. So the plan uh, for today is really, um, we've heard a lot about contact tracing. It's been in the news. There are companies working on it. A lot of people, you know, crosses so many domains from public health, uh, epidemiology to uh, cybersecurity, privacy, software engineering. It's kind of very an interesting topic for a place like BW Tech, where we do have, you know, companies that are working in privacy, security, and even, uh, you know, companies that are also working in the fields of health with life sciences and um, some therapeutics. And the point of this webinar, we really wanted to get a group of experts like yourselves uh, who all are on our cyber advisory board to uh, take part in explaining, you know, how your expertise has informed, you know, what you might think of contact tracing, any conversations you might have been involved with, and uh, really to help some of the attendees, uh, you know, update uh, them on what they might want to think about, consideration, considerations to take into place, and, you know, hopefully we all leave this uh, webinar with a little bit more knowledge on the topic and able to then spread it. Um, bad choice of words for pandemic conversation, but to really, uh, you know, allow the folks that we come into contact with to learn more about contact tracing as well. You know, I think that's the exciting part about these webinars. So the plan for those who are all in attendance is, you know, I'm going to allow the panelists to each introduce themselves, um, you know, explain their background and then uh, give a, you know, a short um, thought about contact tracing before we uh, move into some questions. And the plan is we'll uh, leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if you want to submit questions, feel free to do so in the chat and we'll uh, uh, pick some to discuss. And then uh, throughout this, we'll also ask a couple poll questions so we can get uh, some thoughts from the audience on what they, uh, how they view this. Great, so I think uh, now if we could have, uh, we'll start with Marcus, then Carl, and then Rick, uh, introduce yourselves and then give a, uh, some immediate thoughts on contact tracing. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, um, like you said, my name is Marcus Rauschiger. I'm the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security Cybersecurity Program Director. So that's a mouthful, but <laughs> um, Center for Health and Homeland Security, or CHHS, is a center that's part of the University of Maryland School of Law. And our cybersecurity um, program really focuses on the legal and policy aspects of cybersecurity. So, um, you know, we have several courses that we offer in terms of uh, looking at um, uh, legal uh, policy issues, um, as well as data privacy in the world of cyberspace. And so I'm, I'm responsible for, you know, running that program. Um, we also have um, client work that we do through the center. So we actually have clients for whom we uh, do consulting work. Um, a lot of clients, as you might imagine, come to us, you know, asking what is, what's going on with the cybersecurity stuff. Um, some clients don't know much about it at all. And then we can help them uh, kind of educate them on, on some of the issues and kind of help them navigate and create plans and strategies for how to, address cybersecurity and data privacy for their organizations, whether that's government or the private sector. So um, that's kind of what we do at, at CHHS, what I'm involved in, and I'm happy to talk about, you know, um, this really important issue that's, that's in front of us right now, which are the, the privacy issues related to these contact tracing apps that are emerging now. So looking forward to being part of the panel. Thanks for the intro, and Carl, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, Nick. Um, Carl Wagner, I, um, this is, I'm in my second career. First career was with CIA and, as an operations officer. My last job was Chief of Counterintelligence Operations, and um, under us fell the Insider Threat Program, and so I, I come at this um, with uh, kind of a, a mindset, or at least having experienced um, ubiquitous surveillance of all types, including cyber type surveillance in my and our operations overseas throughout the year. So I have kind of more of a global mindset on this, which uh, reinforces the need for and um, the emphasis I place on privacy. And now I do global risk advisory work. And um, most recently I started a um, company. We have a, uh, an app called Confirmed by BuddyCheck. And it's not a contact tracing app, but it is COVID-19 related and it allows users to um, record, verify, and share in an opt-in 
privacy respecting way their COVID-19 status. And so I've had some uh, discussions with enterprise um, customers about their conundrum. I also, I didn't mention that I was CSO at uh, Chief Security Officer at Tesla under Elon Musk for a little while. So that helps me more easily put myself into their shoes so we can talk about the dilemma that companies face when they have to balance the liability and duty of care with respect for privacy. Um, so I think I can come at it from several different angles. I'm pleased to be here. Awesome. And now, uh, Rick, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rick Forno. I'm a senior lecturer at UMBC and the director of our graduate program in cybersecurity and the assistant director of the UMBC Center for Cybersecurity. Um, like uh, like you heard from Marcus, uh, we, we we take a, a a broad approach to uh, to cybersecurity, both from a, a policy perspective, a legal perspective, and a technical operational perspective. So um, our students um, tend to be working professionals. They're coming to us from the military or the intelligence community or the private sector, looking to expand or enhance their cybersecurity or cyber operations uh, capabilities. Uh, I came to UMBC, like Carl, um, from industry. Uh, my first career, I was in operational cybersecurity from a hands-on keyboard geek early on to chief security officer at the company that uh, actually ran the global DNS system for several years. Uh, so I've, uh, I offered a wide range of perspectives as well. My interests uh, in, in joining this panel today as you probably guessed, deal with the security and privacy implications of contact tracing, given everything that we're seeing in the world today um, from one crisis to another, and just sort of the role of technology and uh, how it can be used or uh, perish thought abused um, uh, as it's adopted more, more widely. So I think we'll have a very interesting discussion today. That's great. And uh, I just want to make sure for those who might have joined and uh, aren't familiar, I'm uh, Nick Sechu and I'm the Senior Manager of Cyber Initiatives at BW Tech. So work with our companies on just uh, helping them grow across any number of uh, projects or how we can, you know, find the right resources. So it's going to be exciting. And one thing I'll start with is uh, we wanted to set the tone for what is contact tracing. And so I've got a, you know, a couple of definitions and key concepts to keep in mind as we discuss for those who might not be as familiar. And so from a, an NIH uh, study I pulled up, contact tracing is really uh, followed by treatment or isolation and is a key control measure in the battle against infectious diseases. Uh, it's known as a, an extreme or locally targeted control and as such has the potential to be highly efficient when dealing with low numbers of cases. Uh, it's frequently used to combat uh, sexually transmitted diseases and uh, new invading pathogens. So some of the concepts that are kept in mind are really to try and trace and monitor uh, the contacts of infected people, notifying them of their exposure, uh, supporting the quarantine of these contacts, and you know, really expanding the resources available to help combat some of these uh, crises and using a method of tools in doing so. And I think that's one of the things we're really uh, seeing in this current environment is all, all the new tools uh, coming about. And especially as uh, most contact tracing prior to this has never been at such a scale. Um, so I'll start with, um, you know, saying maybe, uh, as we touched on, there's a lot of privacy implications. So how do you um, imagine contact tracing uh, could impact the broader privacy regulations we're seeing, like CCPA and GDPR? Um, how might that impact the future conversations as each state is looking at uh, some measures? I think it'd be great if we can just hear a little bit from all of you. I'll, I'll, I'll get us started um, and uh, the others can chime in here. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, when we hear about these um, contact tracing apps and the fact that, you know, they're, these apps are um, tracing our locations and uh, our whereabouts. And, you know, that's the whole point of these apps to figure out who we might have come in contact with and whether or not we might have come in contact with someone uh, who is infected. Um, it just raises a lot of questions and I think people become pretty leery pretty quickly when they hear about apps collecting their location and information uh, with respect to privacy issues. And, um, you know, the, the thing that I think we're Im immediately reminded about, um, in this country at least, is that there is no national level comprehensive privacy law. Um, that provides privacy protections. What we have in this country is more or less a patchwork of privacy laws and regulations that, you know, deal with various industries or 
uh, various issues, um, but there's nothing, nothing comprehensive that provides privacy protections. Um, so, you know, I think we, we look to the states and to other industry regulations and uh, to see if those might offer any kind of privacy protections in this respect when it comes to um, contact tracing apps. But, you know, and then, but we, we quickly learned that, you know, things like GDPR out of the European Union or even CCPA out of California uh, might not really pro offer the level of protection that we might uh, want as users. Um, and, um, and so, in that respect, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk and and and, and new bills have been introduced in, in Congress to address specifically this sharing of um, you know public health information, contact tracing app uh, information that contact tracing apps are collecting. So there are again we see you know new initiatives um, that try to address this privacy issue because we don't have really anything comprehensive in in the U.S. at a national level. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with Marcus. Um, you know, the U.S. has taken a very light regulatory touch when it comes to pr uh, privacy laws, uh, looking to let the marketplace decide what what's more appropriate compared to uh, Europe taking a more privacy centric, uh, customer or user centric approach to privacy. With regards to contact tracing apps, though, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and look at the the entire system, the ecosystem of contact tracing. It's not just the app itself on the phone. It's the data that's collected, where's it going, where's it being stored, who has access to it under what situations. Uh, I mean, if you're tracking, uh, if you're dealing with a pandemic that has a 14 day incubation period, um, you shouldn't be storing six months worth of data um, forever. Okay, so there are, it's not just the actual, the technical aspects, it's the, it's the issues of the data, who owns it, how is it shared, under what circumstances, um, do we want, let's say, law enforcement to have access to uh, pandemic surveillance? Uh, I mean, contact tracing itself is not a new concept. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it's akin to social media monitoring in, in some ways. The NSA calls it contact chaining. Uh, in the hunt for, for terrorists. So this is not exactly a new concept, but we're taking this, the, the, these ideas, these technical processes and technologies and applying them towards public health. And what I worry about is just the slippery, in the absence of a national guideline, national laws, the slippery slope we may be creating for ourselves by rushing to promote and put out contact tracing apps without thinking through all the ramifications involved. Yeah, I'll just jump in and, and riff off of that. Thank you, Rick and, and Marcus. And, um, you know, as I think through um, the criteria to, to go through in your mind when you're looking at an app, and um, we've all seen contact tracing apps outside of the United States that show many examples from the very pervasive in China um, to less pervasive. There are a lot of examples to choose from. Um, I wrote down, is it a government app or is it a private app, right? Is it voluntary or not, right? Um, the limitations on how the data is used, the data retention, as Rick mentioned, is the data collection um, minimized, and then the transparency of the app are all ways in which we can, can look at it and kind of weigh. I think one of the challenges is that um, everybody falls in a different place on the spectrum of privacy versus security. In this case, we're talking about health security, right? I think our, our vision of what security is has expanded. Um, and uh, you know, on the one hand, we want, to, we want to respect the privacy. On the other, what do you do if you're an enterprise? You're trying to reopen, you're trying to make it safe for your employees. So I've talked to uh, chief security officers of these companies. The lawyers are literally at kind of at wit's end. They don't really know what to do. Can They, they can, according to CDC guidelines, require um, that if you're going to come into the office that you be tested and require you to share that information. Um, which doesn't mean that that's a condition of your employment because you could work from home, right? Um, at the same time, they're going to be held liable if uh, somebody, potentially, if somebody um, contracts COVID at work. So the other, while this, the Senate bill is, is being debated, big, big uh, policy issue that's not talked about quite as much in Congress right now is the liability issue. And are the companies going to be held liable and how do you balance that? Um, I just want to point out, as I was doing research for this panel, and I'm, I'm looking at some things globally, um, there are some interesting ways to use technology um, to uh, better kind of um, understand the extent of the pandemic in less developed countries. 
um, but each of them in turn violate the, the user's privacy. Um, satellite images and phone data can, can be used in an aggregated fashion to see where the less developed parts of certain countries are. And then um, there's, there's some, some AI algorithms that are being um, created that are being, uh, they're trying to apply movement of the phones um, to whether or not somebody may have contracted COVID. It's a bit of a stretch, it's interesting. It wouldn't be possible without this technology. And so there are some positive uses of it. Another one was, um, um, actually was a different flavor of that. So uh, in, the, in the third world environment where a lot of these privacy protections don't exist, um, you know, they're being, I think, used some of these apps in, in a novel way, or at least there's some research to try to do so. So just, just some initial comments there. Yeah, and I think some of this uh, conversation, you know, just touched on like how important understanding that liability is. Um, Marcus, can you touch on maybe like, any conversations or thoughts that you might have had with um, regard to these enterprises or maybe um, both yourself and Rick, you could touch on you work at universities that um, inevitably have to make a decision on to how they are going to uh, get back to work uh, with a student population that has different rights than uh, employees. Um, maybe you both could touch on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we, at least at, at UMB, uh, where I work, uh, we're right in the middle of that discussion uh, about what to do come fall. Um, obviously, you know, the end of our semester ended online. Um, the summer classes are online. And now the discussion is about what do we do in the fall uh, when the new um, school year starts. And, you know, there are, you know, faculty meetings being held uh, continuously and, um, you know, um, university council is involved uh, trying to figure out what is the best approach um, when it comes to the fall. Do we have in-person classes? Do we remain uh, online? Um, you know, what, what can we expect of students? Um, what are they, you know, willing to do? Uh, what are the, how do we protect them? Um, but also faculty and staff, um, you know, uh, it's just, <laughs> it, it's a really difficult situation. Uh, everyone's still trying to figure out, you know, you, you get news reports every now and then about what, what certain universities have decided to do. I think, you know, Harvard Law School just decided they're going to be all online again come fall. Um, but uh, it's a really difficult situation and this decisions um, that have to be made for um, universities and, and uh, educational institutions where obviously a lot of people are coming together in a confined space and, um, you know, we want to limit uh, exposure, obviously. Yeah, my, my sympathies are to the uh, university administrators who uh, have to deal with, uh, with so many balls in the air and so many uncertainties or is what... Um, former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns of this. Um, I've been joking for the past few weeks that 2020 is the year of we just don't know. You know, when will we reopen? How will we reopen? Under what conditions will we reopen or close again? Um, it's very hard to plan when you have such uncertainty uh, really across the board, personally, professionally, academically, and so forth. But with regards to UMBC, um, I suspect we're gonna, most of the um, courses probably will be online. Uh, in the fall, with maybe some exceptions for you know first year students, um, lab classes that require you know wet labs and hands on things like that. Um, but again, these discussions are ongoing as to how the reopening will take place. But regardless of how we reopen, when we reopen in person, there certainly will be an opportunity if schools want to pursue contact tracing type of applications or prop, uh, policies. To do it in a way that hopefully respects privacy, but is but is um, effective. It may not be 100% effective, but at least it'll help the university develop a baseline kind of understanding of where they are at any given day and time to determine okay, a student is too sick or or tamp down on possible um, uh, vectors for infection. So, for example, uh, you've heard earlier that some of the, some governments have uh, mandated uh, contact tracing apps being rolled out, uh, you know, Singapore, South Korea, certainly China, the surveillance state, um, have them. Apple and Google are building contact tracing APIs, uh, application programming interfaces into their operating systems for their phones so that um, certain developers, trusted developers can uh, develop contact tracing capabilities. Um, at the UM systems themselves, you know, we can also 
because we control our information environment in many ways, we can also look at things like your Wi-Fi address or your MAC address, uh, the network adapter address on your devices to um, develop uh, anonymized patterns and identities to, again, affect contact tracing in some ways that will still be um, effective yet respect and abide by uh, privacy concerns, which certainly are gonna play a huge part in an environment like a university where there was such a focus on individualism, community benefit and best practices. So uh, I think of all the um, organizations and enterprises out there, the a university and academic environment is probably the one that has the most amount of nuance with how something like contact tracing would be deployed. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think it's, valuable perhaps to think about um, what contact tracing is and compare it to another option. Contact tracing is retrospective, right? And so you're trying to trace back contact that somebody who since found out that they have uh, contracted COVID-19, they've been in contact with. Um, I think what a lot of enterprises are looking for is uh, are some criteria, matrices and risk versus gain tips on how to minimize risk and maximize gain. No decision will be perfect, um, but the, uh, the risk and gain include larger macroeconomic issues for a company is gonna be their, their, their bottom line, but uh, potentially you know, the, the salaries of their employees, et cetera. Um, and I think they're looking for a way in which to um, perhaps treat some of their employees in different ways, depending on their COVID-19 status going forward. Right, and which is why for the company that I just started, we're taking uh, the approach that you know if, if if you've tested and you're willing to share your test status with your employer, um, and you especially if you have IgG antibodies, two types of antibodies, IgG is the longer term one. There shouldn't be a reason why you can't, and we don't know how long the antibodies last. Right, the science is still evolving, but we know that there is some immunity. We don't know for how long. Uh, could you potentially contract it again? Maybe, but chances are there is some type of immunity. Those people could potentially be the ones that we choose to put back on the line if it's a meat processing plant or whatever, or maybe you mix them in with those who have not been exposed because they tested and they share uh, via our app that they, uh, they've not been um, exposed in any way, um, which making them more vulnerable. Or perhaps you know, you just have different procedures for those who haven't been exposed. You, you need to do social distancing, you need to wear a mask. These, this group of people don't because they have IgG antibodies. Maybe in, in, a, in a restaurant, you can have a room where people are a bit freer to interact. So, um, you know, and if, if you have an active infection, well, you better, better stay home, right? Um, but chances are that an active infection is not contagious beyond three weeks, really, at the, at the longer um, interval. Um, and so most epidemiologists and infectious disease experts will tell you that you don't actually need an antibody test to know that if you had COVID in a month ago, you're probably not contagious anymore. So these are best guesses, but it's better than we have now. And I'd like to see us applying our technology to something that organizes us better looking forward. While I, I do agree contact tracing is necessary and, and looking backwards. And I'll just make a final comment on this point. And that is, if we can't with the sophisticated technologies we have program in, a layered approach where we do respect privacy while we allow folks to opt in to a level of ubiquitous surveillance that they're comfortable with depending on what they want, then we're not using our technology uh, in a way that we ought to, that I think is, is possible to, to use it. And, and one other thing I'd like to add, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's being brought up a lot these days about um, contact tracing apps vis-a-vis -vis, uh, employers is whether or not employers um, can um, require their employees to actually sign up for these apps once, they, once they're out there. Um, and whether or not um, you know, employers might be then forced to um, sign up and use these uh, contact tracing apps um, against their will if someone want, does not want to participate in a contact tracing app, you know, whether or not an employer can actually force them to do it anyway, or risk you know, losing their job over not. Um, using the app. So that's, you know, this, this is an issue that's being discussed a lot too. And it's, it's an issue that's being addressed, at least in one of the, of the, the Senate bills that has been introduced, you know, this, this notion that these anti, that these, these contact tracing apps have to abide by some sort of, you know, anti-discrimination um, 
ideal uh, where you know you can't lose a job because uh, you don't want to use a contact tracing app or you can't be denied uh, insurance coverage because you don't want to um, use a contact tracing app so you know those those are some legal issues that are being hotly debated right now too with respect to contact tracing apps and I think that actually ties into the bigger question that we're seeing or issue that we're seeing with um, technology in he- in healthcare more generally uh, that where does your healthcare data go and who's using it, whether it's your fitness tracker or like a smart toilet that has sensors to detect what is going through your body, the, where does that data go and how can it be used against you, let's say, by your insurer to raise your rates if they realize that you've been, uh, you're a heavy drinker because there's more um, alcohol remains you know, in, you know, in the toilet, can they then turn around and increase your insurance rates? So Marcus, I think was, was subtly or not so subtly hinting um, at this being part, contact tracing being part of a much broader discussion about technology and data's data privacy within the medical and, uh, and, and health arena. Yeah, because, you know, someone might think, well, we're talking about health data here. So wouldn't HIPAA apply, you know, this, this comprehensive, you know, pretty, pretty um, robust and powerful, you know, health uh, privacy law with respect to health data. But, but, but that's not the case here with, re- with respect to contact tracing apps. You know, uh, HIPAA only applies to covered entities, entities that are, in, which are usually uh, healthcare providers and their business associates. That's, that's what's covered under HIPAA. So these, these apps that are being developed here, these contact tracing apps, presumably would not fall under any kind of HIPAA protection. So um, it really comes down to, in the end, you know, what is the what is the, in, in lieu of any kind of um, actual law or regulation that would apply, you know, what it comes, to, what it'll come down to is the privacy policy that the app developer puts out there with the app. And, um, you know, you as a user would have to review that privacy policy and, and determine whether or not you feel comfortable uh, with that policy. Um, and, you know, all the questions that, that, that Rick and Carl raised at the beginning of this webinar, you know, what information is being collected? Uh, how is that information being used? With whom is it being shared? You know, um, what kind of recourse is there for you as a user if, if any of this is you know, violated or if the privacy policy is violated? Do you, who enforces that? Do you as a user have a private right of action to sue the app maker? Um, you know, these are all the questions that you know, I think as users, we want very, would, 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 we would want very transparent answers to, um, to be very clear about you know, how, this in, how this app is, is being utilized. Also too, and, and I, I had to stifle a chuckle when you said, you know, users, users have to be aware of, of the privacy policies. How many people on this webinar <laughs> read privacy policies or uh, terms of service? Marcus, put your hand down. I know you probably do, you, <laughs> but we don't. We don't. So how we explain the privacy ramifications and possible consequences to users in a more simplified, straightforward manner is also, I think, part of this discussion too, because contact tracing, these apps are not being pushed out just to the, the geeks of the world or the lawyers of the world. This is going out to people who barely know how to use their cell phone and they don't understand these various nuances. So it's gotta be a very simple explanation so that they know what they're getting into and what they're signing up for or being asked to do. I agree, and I wanted to just throw out a concept that you know sometimes it's not as easy as you might think to know what is attributable data, what is PPI. So while I'm not gonna give you any secrets of my time at Tesla, I will say that we had some debates because one of the first uh, criteria in security, of course, is protect the crown jewels, know what they are. To, to protect them, you have to know what they are. And unless you know what you're not protecting, you're really not protecting anything if you're trying to protect everything, right? Mm-hmm. So um, what are the crown jewels? So we went through the exercise and um, we were pretty smug, smug, and smug, in a smug way, sure of ourselves that the route data for the cars, divorced from the customer data, was not PPI. And uh, until an engineer came to me a few weeks later, and he said, you know, I, I, you know, if I had your route data, I don't have a Tesla, can't afford one. But if I did, um, I can figure out where you live because you're going back to the same place and you're staying there every night. So it's clear, it's obvious, it, it makes sense. Um, and I can find out where you work. And then I can find out that maybe you drink a little bit too much on the weekends because your car zigs and zags. That start, starts to become very private information. Maybe you go somewhere where you don't want people to know once, once a month, right? Um, so applying that to, to health data, we have this app. 
my company does. And we want to, we're working with um, an organization that represents our firefighters across the U.S. They want to know but before they go into a site, if there's a fire or there's a health issue or something, they want to know where the COVID is in the house. I'm promising to our users, I'm not going to share their data unless they opt in to sharing it um, in, in an anonymized way. So how do I anonymize that? Um, but I know that even if they think it's anonymized, I know what real anonymization is and it's probably, I have to be a little bit more severe about it than what they're going to expect. I still want to serve that the purpose of keeping the firefighters safe. Uh, so it, it becomes a lot more complex than you think. Uh, the, the best you can do is be aware of the privacy policies and force these companies to explain to you at every level, okay, how is that data used? Are you selling it? Okay, that's, we'll get that out of the way. You're not selling it, you're giving it away in an anonymized way. To whom, for what reason, why? Is it really anonymized? How could one find out who I am? Do I really have anything to hide? I mean, that's an argument I don't like. I've got nothing to hide, so I'll give everybody everything. That doesn't wash with me. I spent 30 years protecting our rights in this country that are different from those overseas. So I want to see them protected. Um, so again, I guess I come with more questions than answers myself. Um, as we uh, you know, get into this discussion, one of the things that keeps coming up is how important it is to keep those security measures in place. Maybe, um, Rick, you could speak to some of the things that, you know, what are some of the things we want to see in these apps? Some of the features that you know, can at least start towards being uh, at least some level of consideration to use. And also, you know, looking at, you know, you've had, there's going to be vulnerabilities that are discovered. I think India had a problem with this, with their contract tracing app where it was discovered. And, you know, if it's being used already by millions of people, how do you want to see companies reacting to that? I think, um, firstly, we have to uh, vet the developers themselves who are developing these contract tracing apps. So you don't have 80 or 100 apps in an app store of which only two or three of them are really reputable and the rest are malware or horribly coded or have privacy or security ramifications. Um, Apple and Google are taking a pretty um, ironclad approach, even more so than usual with their app stores to limit who can do contact tracing apps at the moment, which I think is a good, a, a good thing. So you have to um, vet the developers, the company uh, making these, these apps, but then from a security perspective, proper software development techniques, uh, ensuring that the data, there, there's no uh, data spillage, no ability to share data between um, apps on the mobile device. Um, all, the, uh, as again, a lot of the best practices of, of software development and cybersecurity that we, we all espouse for years come into play here, just like anything else. But there's an extra level of sensitivity involved because we're talking about data that may not be medical data, but it certainly is being used for medical purposes um, on, on a much larger scale. So you have to protect, make sure the software is developed according to best uh, secure software uh, designs. You have to ensure that the data is protected on the phone, that it is not leaked or, or, or can escape to other apps. Other apps can't read that data. You have to ensure that the data, when it leaves the phone, if it leaves the phone, where's it going? How is it protected in transit to that destination somewhere in the cloud for a government or uh, some company to analyze. Uh, and remember, and then how are they protecting that data on their end? Remember, the cloud is really just somebody else's computer. So it does us no good to have really awesomely designed contact tracing apps and great security on the endpoint, only to upload our data into a, into a, a, a server that is wide open for data to be, to be stolen. So it's a combination of best cybersecurity practices all along the way. With the, ex, with the recognition that there's also a higher degree of trust involved given the nature of contact tracing data generated. And as Carl said, um, what that could mean about developing a profile of an individual user. And um, that I think is really where the sticking points are because once you lose that level of trust in the, uh, in, in the, the, the app or the, the tracing ecosystem, people aren't gonna wanna play and the functionality just disappears. Uh, if, if they can't trust the, uh, the app, the data, and the app is protected appropriately, then why participate? Yeah, and I'll just add to, add, to, add to that that this is a moving target, right? And so I think we've yeah. all seen apps that version 1.0, 2.0, good to go, good to go. Update comes along and all of a sudden it's a leaky app, right? And so how do you vet that over time? We all have lives and things to do. Um, 
to make sure that uh, they're they're retaining those standards, or, and or that the privacy policy doesn't change policy doesn't change all of a sudden. And they sure they put it in their terms of use, but do you really read that even if you read it the first time, or are you going to read it every time? Right, and and when they're designing the software, um, it can't take the, the normal mobile app design. I mean, they they call it agile development. You know, push something out. You know every hour or every day. Um, I view that as sloppy programming or lazy programming. Let's just do what we can every day. Um, that I think opens you up to a rash of, um, of errors and sloppy coding and potential problems. So particularly with apps like this, where trust is so paramount, um, it, the, you can't do uh, agile development. It's gotta be a robust release and then see, see if there are any problems and then do another robust release. But right. these incremental drops along the way could certainly present security and privacy problems. And uh, again, impact the, the level of trust that the users who are providing data as a resource um, are not comfortable doing, and it breaks the entire idea of contact tracing. No, no that's, I really appreciate all of your uh, opinions on this. And I think at this point, I wanna make sure that we can um, open up some polls to um, some of the attendees as well as panelists uh, along the lines of, you know, some that we were planning to do initially, but the conversation just, you know, got started and it was uh, great. So I'm going to launch one poll here that participants can uh, take advantage of while we, uh, you know, speak and maybe in the next uh, couple minutes, we'll see the results of that. And I think that one of the things I want to touch on and get your uh, opinion of is, you know, I saw a stat that 83% of companies don't have the processes or systems in place to track all of their workforce. I think that came from PwC. And so how do you see this um, fitting into conversation around the broader digital transformation taking place during COVID? And to what extent might you see this, you know, really um, accelerating employee tracking within, uh, you know, organizations and, you know, greater insider threat programs as we look to track more? I think this goes back to what Carl said earlier about you know, developing profiles on, on users of these apps and the unintended consequences. Um, I have seen news articles and, and stories in recent days about expressing concerns that employers, questioning whether employers have the right to know what I'm doing on the weekend and where I go uh, or who I see or who I associate with or if I was at a protest or whatever the case would be. Um, so this goes back to the idea of you know, collecting the barest amount of information that is needed to do contact tracing, we call it data minimization, and then ensuring that the minimum number of corporate eyes or other eyes can see the data to develop so they can't develop this profile. I've got no problem with them knowing if I've been exposed in some way, but they don't need to know which grocery store I go to or when I shop or which bar I might go to on a Saturday evening with, with friends. That I think is a little too invasive and would probably turn off a lot of Americans to the idea of contact tracing by their employers. I agree. I think the systems technically need to be designed and many of them are. The companies simply haven't, many of them implemented this type of technology to track their use of work devices or their time while at work. It has to be done in a way that respects privacy, that has governance and is communicated to the employees so that it's an environment of trust and not a black and white um, one against the other type of approach. And contact tracing doesn't change that. I've got no right as chief security officer of Tesla to know where you went on the weekend. Um, I wanna ask you to show me and possibly to prove to me what your COVID-19 status is and if you can't do that, then why don't you just work from home? That's an option. So that that balances the privacy and security, I think. And it, it as Rick said uh, before, it, this all comes back to the users having to trust the app. And they can only trust the app if they feel confident that the, about what type of information is being collected and how it's being used. And that means that um, the data, there has to be data minimization. There has to be a, a, a strict limit to how this data can be used. You know, it, it can, it really may only, should only be used to identify, you know, uh, if someone has come into contact with someone else who has been infected, that should be it. There should really be no other, you know, um, uh, permitted use for this kind of information. And, and if that is the case, and if, if, if users feel confident that that is the only way that their data is being used, then I think you will see more trust. And that means there will be a greater uptake in the amount of users who actually use these kinds of apps. And that's, you know, we, we do want a lot of people using this because we want to be able to 
do the contact tracing, which is a fundamental, you know, uh, best practice for handling pandemics. And, and you know, in, in the past, we've, we've been doing this manually, um, you know, but now why not try to use our technology to help us with this? But if we are going to use technology, um, then we have to make sure that the technology is being used in, a, in the right way so that um, it actually is helpful to us and not detrimental to our privacy rights as users. No, and I think you really touched on a great point there, Marcus, when you bring up, you know, the cost and how technology can help alleviate some of that. You know, we're looking at, you know, thousands being employed as part of these contact tracing programs. Um, maybe just, you know, everyone sharing some thoughts with regards to some of the economics of this. It reminds me a lot of how security vendors talk about, you know, a force multiplier and, you know, what thoughts you might have around, you know, some of the costs that are associated with this. Well, I think, um, I mean, there's always going to be a, a level of manual contact tracing um, for people that don't have phones or mobile devices that there will always seem to be public health workers that go out, uh, you know, various you know, cities or out in the hinterlands or wherever to do manual follow up. Uh, I think that's always going to be there. The economics, I think, where the benefits would come into play would be for companies or large organizations that can better uh, understand what their employee statuses are and then tell them to, whether or not to come to work or stay at home. I think longer term, this may lead some organizations to rethink how many large office facilities they actually need. Because I think COVID-19 these past few months have shown that when people are working from home, they're not slacking off as so many employers have thought for years. Uh, that, that, that stigma, I think, has finally been smashed, which is a good thing. So that, I think, is where one of the big economic benefits could come into play here as employers understand how their employees can function, and they could probably start saving costs on the facilities and the infrastructure side because they don't need to have you know, huge office parks anymore or as many as they used to have. Yeah, I, I would just point out there are certain industries that have been designed that possibly can be changed, but to require close contact of employees. And you think about the meat processing industry. Um, one of the experts recently told me that they're looking at potentially building a lot more meat plants that have a lot less throughput and that have many fewer employees. So that's going to require a lot of um, um, capital uh, investment. I don't know if that will happen or not, but uh, you look at the mining industry. Is it possible that in the mining industry, you can get to a situation where you don't have anywhere between 500 and 2,000 miners in close proximity to each other, um, very hard. So in some ways, you know, you can only work from home in certain industries. Um, I think the cost versus benefit analysis many times comes down to this. Think of yourself sitting at work. Um, you're upset because you've got, you're being forced to have contact. I don't think one can force you. I hope the law comes out to say that, um, you know, Contact tracing is not in, is not enforceable by employers. But let's say that you begrudgingly, voluntarily use contact tracing. The person next to you didn't. They brought COVID in. They got it to you, and you were out for two months, or God forbid, you died. That's a huge economic cost. Your your if you or your family members are going to sue the company. So there's a, a large liability cost, and there there should be. Companies need to be held to account to properly benefit, uh, properly balance the, the risk versus gain. And there's a lot of it's more complex than, than you think. So um, it's, it's, it's not as easy a decision. The, the privacy part, I think, you know, even for the individual, if it's uh, you and the, other, the person next to you, it looks one way when, it's, uh, when you're the one with COVID and another way when they're the one with COVID or they're the one whose who's, you know, contacts are being traced. No, I appreciate your thoughts on that. And I wanna take a moment to share the results of that poll. Um, basically split down the middle as far as uh, people that have engaged in or anticipate to use contact tracing and I find that pretty interesting. Um, I haven't had, you know, the opportunity to come into contact with some of these apps, but I think this is, you know, all made me think about it a little bit more. And uh, now as we look at having about, you know, a little over 10 minutes left, uh, probably moving into a and a portion from some of the attendees and also if you're an attendee and you have a question you'd like to submit, uh, I'd be happy to you know, I'd be appreciative if you could submit those right now and we'll try and get as many answers as we can. There are a few questions already in the Q&A, I see. Yep, there are. Um, so 
Tim Finan um, has asked, can panelists comment on the technical aspects of the Google Apple approach? And is everyone on the panel satisfied with it or could it be improved? I have not looked too closely at the Google or, Google or Apple approach to contact tracing um, to, to really comment one way or the other on it. Uh, Apple has sort of got this aura of being very, very pro-privacy and pro-security, Google less so, but I have, again, nobody's really, at least I haven't looked into it to, to comment which approach is better or if I'm comfortable with, with, with either. Sorry. Uh, I'm also not familiar um, in depth. I would say that I believe it's a Bluetooth approach, which has certain benefits on the privacy side and uh, deficiencies on the technical side, frankly. Yeah, it's my understanding that, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of doing this contact tracing, um, you know, GPS tracing versus Bluetooth tracing is one question. Um, GPS would actually obviously be a little more accurate, but it's certainly more in, um, uh, you know, invasive of privacy. Bluetooth tracing, um, you know, provides a little bit more anonymity perhaps. Um, so that's the approach Apple, Google have taken. Um, I think they also, there's also this issue um, or this debate between storing um, your contacts, you know, on device versus storing them in some sort of centralized database that's hosted on a server somewhere. Uh, so I think uh, Apple, Google have chosen to keep that data on device um, as opposed to putting it in some centralized database. Obviously the, you know, there, there's a risk for having a, when you have a centralized database that, you know, that database somehow gets, um, hacked or you know that data gets leaked um so i think apple google has made the decision that um it's safer to keep that uh, uh information on device although there are some downsides to that too it's my understanding that you know again you're able as a user you might be able to see that data on your device and then maybe make some um assessments as to um you know who might actually be infected with covid based on on the, the data device, the device, the data on your device. Um, so there's there's pros and cons to these approaches. I think um, you know fundamentally the most important thing is that these the, whatever approach an app developer takes uh, is 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 an open and transparent approach so that it can be reviewed and scrutinized. Um, so that again, if you know as if a lot of people look at the methodology or the the develop the developer and how they've chosen to develop the app that the, the, that can be looked at and understood and therefore again we get back to this trust issue that if 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 uh if it's deemed to be you know um as protective of privacy as possible then uh and there's you know some sort of open recognition of that um then i think you will end up having more users trust the app and maybe and hopefully perhaps more users will then use the app uh, which will, of course, benefit the ultimate goal of, of these apps. What we're going to see, I think, with con with contact tracing app development uh, go over time is a great example of technology far outpacing the speed of law and policy. Uh, that's been a perennial problem uh, you know, in the days of the modern internet going back to the early 90s. Uh, technology evolution has always moved more quickly than, than, than law and policy. So there's going to be catch up to do. And um, we have to recognize that as a, as a community and balance that knowing that, and there are some laws, as Marcus said, that are already being proposed, that, that that's good to see this happening as the technology is being developed. So they're kind of being developed side by side, which is something we didn't see 10 or 15 years ago. The law always played catch up. Um, so you've got the legal concerns are going to and or restrictions are going to directly impact how we roll out contact tracing and to what degree that's that's a success if the law is too narrowly focused contact tracing may not be as effective even if we have the great technology to do it because the law says we can't and as a final point too about the technology and the law we also need to look at globally uh each country is designing their their various contact tracing apps which is good but think about how pandemics spread around the world. Folks travel hither and yon. So we may have a bunch of uh, data suggesting that travelers are coming by plane from Europe, but maybe because of GDPR, they can't share information with us from their contact tracing apps. 
which can make things more complicated for public health authorities in trying to respond and get a better understanding of the spread of, of a pandemic. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's um, I think the um, federal system here with the different um, trends in different states is a microcosm of what we're seeing globally. Although the added feature from the global programs that there's a lot more, or there are there are some ubiquitous systems out there, such as the Chinese one, such as the Qatari one, like we don't have here yet. Um, and I also want to just point out, it seems to me, uh, riffing off of something that Marcus said, you know, we've had this tracking ability for some time, right? So we're, I think we're used to that part. The part that nobody should, I don't think get used to is that you have the ability to see everybody that I'm, that I'm meeting with all the time, right? And so how is that? How, how is all that? Basically, it's what we used to do in, in counterterrorism, right? The relational databases we use to build out somebody's um, social network, but on a massive scale for every um, American that would use one of these, 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 uh, these apps. So, you know, again, I don't mind the tracing as much as I do. Why do you need to know everybody that I'm in touch with? Yeah. Right? So, it's, it's, it's the, the tracing of the, your contacts, but also the, the profiling of your activities. Exactly. And that's that, that second order metadata, if you will, that I think is a much more sinister and ominous concern for us to deal with in a public health sense. That's right. So we have about five minutes left. I want to see if we can try and get two questions answered. Uh, we have uh, Samir uh, from Ardent Privacy, uh, one of our uh, BW Tech companies that engages in privacy, security, uh, and data-centric security issues, has stated, you know, separation of duties should be enforced in giving control to medical data to the same companies that might sell that data as a business model is probably not going to help privacy. Um, can anyone just uh, offer some brief thoughts on that? I wanna make sure that we have time to get to the other questions too. Short answer, absolutely true. You want to have separation of, of power, separation of data. The last thing you wanna have is somebody downloading a contact tracing app to their phone and buying into the system only to find a couple of days later, they're surfing the web on their phone and they see a pop-up for flu, flu medicine or your nearest co uh, COVID testing center because your phone suddenly knows that you are looking up or you've been around people. That right there would break the level of trust. So yes, indeed, we've got to segregate this data and these apps across the board. Great, I appreciate that answer. And then- um, Whatever Samir says is spot on because Samir knows his business and he's got a great uh, business model and it's a great example of what BW Tech uh, produces. We appreciate those words, uh, Carl. And uh, maybe the last uh, question while we still have some time is, uh, in many countries, uh, contact tracing is being done manually via personal interviews. Uh, how can an automated systems be integrated into this approach? And while being, that's being answered, I will um, start a final poll. Um, whoa. Oh, that's your poll. Sorry. Um, I, I would say, I mean, yeah, you, the, the technology can support manual, uh, manual tracing uh, interviews. Um, the, man, the, the contact tracing when it's done manually is an interview. There are a series of, of questions that the interviewer will ask the, uh, the individual, the, the respondent. Contact tracing apps, for the most part, tend to be silent in the background in many ways. They're not asking the end user questions uh, to respond on their phone. Some may, but the idea, I believe, as we're talking about contact tracing apps is for this to kind of function in the background, silently seeing who, who you're around and associating with, and then collecting that data. So it's not an interview-based contact tracing experience like it is in some of these other countries where people actually go out into the fields with a pen and paper and um, and ask a series of questions. And I think as was mentioned before, I don't think this is going to be an either or. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to see both can, both approaches continue. Both approaches are still necessary. Um, but, you know, I think the idea with these these apps is just that, you know, why don't we try to utilize technology to help us in our in our tracing and um, you know, trying to figure out how to best use, utilize technology for purposes of public health. Um, but the, certainly the manual tr tracing is gonna continue as well. It's, it's absolutely necessary. So they'll complement each other. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I think that uh, you know, 
a, a lot of what we need to worry about when you're talking about a pandemic, I think, is time. So time elapsed between when you do your contact tracing, kind of complete it, is is time wasted that I think results in in, in a bigger problem. Um, and so, using the technology to do this more quickly is great. And I think um, adding a layer on top of predictive analytics and some inferences and to give it to public health authorities so that they can understand. Gee, on the south side of Chicago. Um, we get a lot of people with antibodies. Well, why is that? Well, that makes sense. Maybe it's somewhat lower socioeconomics. They had a higher COVID rate, but now they have the antibodies. Let's let's do something about that. So it's not just at the individual level, but at the broad um, population health level. What what inferences can we draw? How can we be more predictive? How can we use the technologies to go to the next level and and do something positive with it? Well, I want to thank you all for your time and. Uh, you know, your thoughts on these subjects, uh, sharing the last results of the poll, and it seems that uh, most people have uh, concerns with, you know, just being aware of how this information is being used, whether it's privacy data or just the sheer number of apps. And, you know, we have one minute left. Maybe if we can go around and everyone can just share a final thought they have uh, on the subject. And I want to thank everyone who was able to attend and participate. Um, just real quick, you know, I think uh, as, as potential users of these apps, I think we, we're going to want to really um, demand that transparency. We want to know exactly what the answers are to those questions that we uh, posed here at the beginning of the, the panel. Um, I think we want to keep a close eye on what's happening on Capitol Hill in terms of some of the bills that are being proposed there. I think, um, you know, we're going to make sure that that our privacy as users is is protected, and um, you know I think uh, it's it's absolutely vital for not just our our privacy interests, but I think in, for the efficacy of this of this initiative of this public health initiative. Um, I would just say that I, I think we have the ability if we're smart using all all of the technology at our disposal, all of our mature understanding of privacy. Um, to appropriately address the issues at hand, that taking into account our federal system, the diversity of our economy, of our people, so that it's not one size fits all, right? And that we can deal with um, just incredibly vexing and, and, and troublesome population health issues in our densely populated cities without completely paralyzing um, our rural areas, right? We have, we have to use the technology to um, uh, accommodate both ends of the spectrum and, and I think we can and, and and we'll do it while respecting privacy along the way. I think um, we have to approach this like we approach any or, or the way we should approach any new technology innovation and that is think this through from from end to end don't blindly rush into things and throw it throw it against the wall and see what sticks we have to be mindful of what we're getting into we have to be aware of both the conveniences and the benefits, as well as the, the risks and the costs involved, both technically and legally. Um, we can't have um, a situation where the law set, um, is too narrow or too broad, and that can create technical problems, and vice versa. So it has to be developed in parallel, and uh, we have to also, as a bottom line, ensure that we look at not just the benefits, but also the, the, the consequences and potential risks to make sure we do this right and we maintain user trust. Great, well, I, wanna, I really appreciate everyone's uh, final thoughts. We're about two minutes over, so I wanna respect everyone's uh, schedule and uh, wish you all some good health and uh, hope that we can do some great panels uh, going forward. Thanks, Thanks you, Megan, for Thank uh, organizing this. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus and Rick, for allowing me to be on the same panel with you guys. Likewise. We, we should yeah. catch up sometime. We should. Be great. <laughs> we probably crossed some paths earlier in, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or, earlier in life. Definitely. And so all you folks out there, we have um, looking forward to, to interacting with you all during office hours or in whatever capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Take care.